Good morning. Uh, thank you for joining today's Medicare webinar. And my name is Catherine Martucci. I'm the Senior Director for Program Strategy and Management. For those of you who are not familiar with the Alliance, welcome. Um, we are a nonpartisan resource for the policy community dedicated to advancing knowledge and understanding of health policy issues. And this is the final event in a part series that we've done on the future of Medicare. You can find more information about the series, the previous events we've done in the series on our website. And then today's briefing is brought to you in joint partnership with the Commonwealth Fund and Arnold Ventures. We're very grateful to have them um, in partnership on this. And you can join the conversation on Twitter today using the hashtag AllHealthLive. And please join our communities on all, at All Health Policy as well as on Facebook and LinkedIn. And then we definitely want you to be an interactive part of this conversation today. So um, we'll have some opening um, remarks from each of the speakers um, and then a robust Q&A. So please get your questions ready. Um, you should see a dashboard on the right side of your web browser that has a speech bubble icon with a question mark. You can use that speech bubble icon to submit questions you have at any time. We'll be collecting these and addressing them throughout the broadcast. And if you also are experiencing any technical issues, you can chat um, using that function as well and someone will attempt to help you. And so I'm pleased to introduce our moderator that will be guiding this conversation this morning. Bill Hoagland is a senior vice president at the Bipartisan Policy Center. He helps to direct and manage fiscal health and, and economic policy analyses. He previously has served as Vice President of Public Policy for Cigna Corporation. And on top of all of that, he's completed 33 years of federal government service, including 25 years on the US Senate staff. So we're very honored that he's agreed to bring all of that expertise to guide this conversation. And the other wonderful panelists that we'll have in this discussion today Adeze Anekwichi is an operating partner at Welsh Carson Anderson and & Stowe, an investment firm, and she focuses on growth-oriented healthcare companies. In addition to her private sector experience, she has many years in federal policy roles at CBO, MedPAC, and the head of health programs at the White, Ho White House Office of Management and Budget under President Obama. Bowen Garrett, a senior fellow in the Health Policy Center at the Urban Institute, um, focuses on health reform and health policy topics with recent research examining the labor market effects of the Affordable Care Act, as well as the design of Medicare's payment systems for post-acute care. We also have Josh Gordon, the Director of Health Policy for the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, where he leads research um, into the effect of federal policies on health and the healthcare system. And prior to joining the committee, Gordon was a policy communications consultant and a senior healthcare policy fellow at the Progressive Policy Institute. And last but certainly not least, Harriet Komisar, a senior strategic policy advisor on the health security team in AARP's Public Policy Institute, where she focuses on Medicare and other healthcare policy topics she has extensive research experience, and prior to joining AARP, Harriet was a research professor at the Health Policy Institute um, and the Georgetown Public Policy Institute. Um, with that, uh, thank you all so much for joining. Wonderful expertise on this. Um, I'll turn it over to Bill to give us some opening thoughts. And Bill, uh, I believe you're muted. Thank you, uh, can you, thank you very much, uh, Catherine and the Alliance for sponsoring this very timely discussion. Uh, the 2016 Medicare Trustees Annual Report to Congress was the first uh, to project that the hospital insurance fund, uh, most recently that the hospital insurance fund's HI fund would be depleted in 2026. That gave legislatures uh, 10 years to address that uh, issue. Then the 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, and last year's 2021 trustees report also continue to project uh, the depletion of the fund 
uh, to be in the year 2026. We await, and rumor has it that it could be very soon, this year's 22 trustees report. If I were a betting man, and I am not, I would bet that 2026 will continue to remain a very likely depletion date for the trust fund. Um, given that I predict uh, Democrats and Republicans both do not want to even discuss this issue in this year's in a midterm election year, that means we will likely have to wait another year uh, before Congress begins to think seriously about the implications of the trust fund depletion, and that then may mean we only have two years left. Um, I reviewed the language from uh, each of the trustees' reports going back at least to 2016, and maybe no surprise, but uh, it appears to me to be a cut and paste. The wording in each one is very similar, if not identical, to the, to the previous years. And let me just read that to you. Uh, the Board of Trustees believes that solutions can and must be found to ensure the financial integrity of the HI fund in the short and long term and to reduce the rate of growth through viable, and I emphasize the word viable means. The sooner solutions are enacted, the more flexible and gradual they can be. Moreover, the early introduction of reforms increases the time available for affected individuals and organizations, including healthcare providers, beneficiaries, and taxpayers to adjust their expectations and behavior. I should also note that uh, next Wednesday, the Congressional Budget Office will release its annual budget and economic update, a little late also. Um, in the releases of the past, and I'm sure will be the same this year, they will estimate the federal trust fund status uh, again. Uh, so we can expect that next Wednesday. And their last update a year ago, CBO projected the HI trust fund would be depleted in 2027, just slightly beyond 2026. So this morning, um, we are going to hear from these four excellent experts on number one, what the depletion of the trust fund means as it relates to providers, Medicare beneficiaries, and taxpayers and the advertised purpose, of course, of this session, and that is what are the policy options Congress and the administration could adopt to promote Medicare sustainability in a viable fashion? So with that, let's start with our first uh, expert. Uh, Bowen, I'm turning it over to you. Great, uh, thank you, Bill, and good morning. I'm grateful for the opportunity to provide some background. Um, on Medicare's financial challenges and help provide context for discussing some of the policy solution uh, ideas. If we go to the next slide, please. Uh, and one more, please. Um, so 64 million Americans, elderly and disabled, rely on Medicare for health insurance, but the program faces serious short and long-term uh, financial pressures. Um, from a financing perspective, Medicare has uh, two components, the hospital insurance or HI trust fund, and the supplemental medical insurance or SMI trust fund. Uh, HI funds inpatient hospital care and other Part A services, while SMI funds physician visits and other Part B services, as well as prescription drugs under Part D. Both of these components um, fund Part C, Medicare Advantage or MA, um, and that's those costs are split according to the estimated proportions of Part A and B services used by MA enrollees. So let me co compare and contrast the two. HI is largely financed through a payroll tax on workers' earnings, while SMI is financed roughly 25% by beneficiary premiums and 75% uh, by general federal revenues. The HI trust fund has a hard constraint on its spending. When dedicated inflows and accumulated surpluses are insufficient to cover its spending, the amount it pays for covered benefits must somehow, somehow, hasn't happened, be cut. There's no such constraint for SMI. General revenues uh, will make up any shortfall. Uh, next slide, please. So as Bill was just, was just saying, uh, the Congressional Budget Office and the Medicare's trustees 
both forecast uh, for now that the HI Trust Fund will be insolvent around 2026. That's really soon. And the expected date has been somewhat volatile, volatile through the pandemic. It was down estimated at 2024 at one point. Um, and, then it came, and then it came back up uh, as things recovered. Uh, in the past, Congress has always acted to prevent HI insolvency and to avoid its serious effects. If HI insolvency is not avoided, full payments to providers for services covered under Part A would be delayed. Medicare would only be able to pay hospitals and other Part A providers 91 cents on every dollar it owes for patient care. This would put significant financial stress on providers and health plans um, that can cause serious disruption and harm patient care. Uh, next slide, please. This figure shows historical and projected HI spending. At various points through history and uh, most visibly here in the early 2000s, HI brought in more revenue than it paid out. These surpluses accumulated in the HI trust fund with interest. At its peak in the mid 2000s, which is not shown in this figure, uh, the trust fund had enough in reserve to pay for 1.5 years of spending. From the late 2000s on, HI spending had mostly exceeded, has, has, has mostly exceeded its receipts. And year by year, those accumulated surpluses have been spent out. If those balances are depleted in 2026, HI will no longer have the buffer it's been using to pay for its operating deficit. From 2026 to 2030, the projected cumulative deficit is $364 billion. Um, that's the gap over there on the um, on the left hand right hand side of the screen, um, and so that's the magnitude of the near term financial problem uh, that reforms need to address. So we can go to the next slide, please. This figure shows historical and projected Medicare spending by part as a percent of gross domestic product or GDP. Total spending, the sum over A, B, and D is projected to rise from about 4% of GDP now uh, to nearly 6% in 2040. And it was a bit over 2% in 2000. So the government will need to raise or borrow ever increasing amounts to pay for the level of spending projected under the current program. But we can also see from the graph that the larger long-term problem isn't part A. That's not what's causing our immediate problem, it's part B whether the spending is coming from traditional Medicare or Medicare Advantage. Uh, next slide, please. This figure shows the historical and projected Medicare financing by source. It also shows how these, in total, stack up relative to total spending shown on the solid line, all shown here as a share of GDP. Here we see as well the HI deficit for Part A. We don't see a similar deficit related to parts B and D because general revenue and premium financing are automatically increased to fill any gap. There are two minor sources of financing I won't get into, and that's the OASDI, Social Security benefits, and um, state transfers and, and drug fees, because th th those are smaller. But uh, payroll taxes dedicated to part A um, include the 2.9% tax on earnings paid equally by employees and employers, that's 1.45% each. Um, it also includes the 0.9% additional, additional Medicare tax on earnings of more than uh, 250,000 for those um, married filing jointly and 200,000 uh, um, for individuals. Because the payroll taxes are fixed percentages of earnings, um, projected payroll receipts stay roughly flat over time as a share of GDP. For premiums, these are set each year as fixed percentages of parts B and D spending respectively. So they automatically increase with spending. That also means that the premium burden on beneficiaries will rise faster than incomes tend to rise. Um, note that there's a base premium for traditional Part B currently at $171 a month. Medicaid may pay that for lower income enrollees, but the premium uh, rises with rises for enrollees with higher incomes up to $408 a month. Payments could be lower in MA depending on the plan and then also vary by plan in Part D. Uh, but federal 
General federal revenues finance the rest of parts B and D. So federal spending will automatically rise with higher premium spending and will grow as a share of GDP. We should keep in mind that as long as we're running federal def budget deficits, the general revenue category could be considered as being financed through uh, additional government borrowing. Uh, next slide, please. So to wrap up, let me offer a few things we need to think about as we weigh the different options for dealing with these financing problems. First, reforms may take a minimalist approach or a more comprehensive approach, a broader approach. Um, uh, it could only do minimally what is necessary to deal with the insolvency and push it out uh, a bit more time. Um, or Congress could really pursue and deal with the longer term sustainability. The HI Trust Fund is really the only budget mechanism that can force action on Medicare. So fixing the shortfall uh, in the short term provides an opportunity to pursue broader uh, changes as well. Second, the different approaches we would take will have different implications for who will bear the burdens of improving, uh, improving Medicare's finances. So should beneficiaries pay even more in premiums or higher, have higher cost sharing for the services they use or have fewer benefits to access? If so, which uh, enrollees should be doing that? And should provider payments or payments to plans be reduced uh, instead or in addition? And if so, which, which providers? Should normal wage earners or higher income individuals be taxed more if we're going to raise more revenues? Or should we just take on, will, will we just take on more debt and let unidentified future taxpayers deal with all of this? So we posed questions along these lines to a group of Medicare experts we convened last year. Panelists generally thought the broad reforms to Medicare uh, were unlikely, though there were some very strong um, proponents of some of those ideas. More feasible, they thought, would be an approach to combining increased revenue with some increased revenue with targeted spending reductions that minimize impacts on beneficiaries, which most thought was very important. Um, no clear preferred approach uh, to increasing revenues emerged in the discussion. I think one could make a strong case on a fairness basis for expanding the base of the net income, net investment income tax on high income individuals to include the incomes of active participants in S corporations and limited partnerships. And then I think you can make a practical case for then dedicating all the receipts of the NIIT tax to the HI trust fund, which was by the way, originally contemplated for the, the Affordable Care Act. So finally, uh, Medicare payments to hospitals are thought to be in line with costs already, um, but payments to some acute care providers and Medicare Advantage plans are considered by many to be too high and could be an appropriate place to look for savings. So with that, I will turn it back to Bill. Thank you. Thank you, Bowen. And now we'll go to a Daisy, who is currently an operating partner at Wells Carson, Anderson and Stowe. Over to you, a Daisy. Thank you, Bill. And uh, thank you to the Alliance and um, Arnold for putting this event together. Bowen, for, for our listeners, Bowen just gave us a, a pretty good overview of what is a complex financing scheme just for Part A alone. But I think when you think about the entire Medicare program, it, it's fair to acknowledge that this is not easy. Uh, next next slide, please. Um, and so I, uh, next one, thank you. <laughs> I will tee up um, how this conversation um, started uh, for me, I think a, a couple of years ago the Commonwealth Fund reached out and basically, you know, uh, asked several policy analysts, some of us have our for former policy analysts to think about what should Medicare be, what should the, the, you know, the Congress and Medicare program be thinking about when we are facing a looming insolvency and very few policy options on the table. And this, this is again, back in 2020, the papers came out in 2021. We were in the midst of a COVID pandemic that was still ramping up at that time. And as you can imagine, very little appetite, political appetite for uh, a major policy discussion. My challenge, at least that I imposed on myself, was to think about the global discussion around healthcare policy uh, a few years prior and at the time, and quite frankly, still, 
And that is this issue of health equity, because it's hard to contemplate major policy revisions to the Medicare program, whether you're talking about benefit design, financing, or what have you, and not contemplate the very real and salient topic of health equity, which continues to be um, an unattained goal uh, across the healthcare system. Um, and so it is an imperative um, that I think we, we introduce uh, the issue and it shouldn't really be introduced. It should be part and parcel any broader conversation around Medicare because the health inequities are a huge driver of um, excess costs, excess waste in the system. And I think it behooves us as policymakers to think about how to do better and what options there are um, in the program. Next slide, please. So Medicare can do um, the following. And again, this is sort of uh, reflected in the paper, take the lead on health equity. And I, I, I think I should say at this point that there are indications that the program is thinking about health equity, introducing incentives, perhaps through the ACO REACH program um, at CMMI or the Innovation Center to, in, to incentivize screening for social determinants of health, to incentivize data collection on race, ethnicity, and SDOH data. It is not possible really to do this work and do it fully without really good data collection and really good data assets around race, ethnicity, and other social drivers of health, because without data, you don't know what you're solving. You don't know how big your gaps are. You don't know for whom. You can't really, well, you can't target very well any interventions, no matter how well designed they are to the right people. And so the data element, both the collection, this, the, the screening and the dynamic screening of social determinants, because people's situations change over time, that element cannot be, it's hard to overstate the importance of that as part of this effort. And I think, you know, CMS is, is well on, on, um, on course, if you will, and, and doing some work in this space, even if it is at the pilot phase. Um, incentivizing providers training on bias and discrimination and racism when individuals are interacting with the healthcare system. We haven't had as much of a conversation around this, but again, and this would be for everybody, not for, not for particular providers, there's a need for, I think if we're hearing what people who experience bias and discrimination, um, if, if we're hearing them and we're, we're paying attention, I think um, it, it calls for widespread training, either as part of nursing or um, medical training and others, quite frankly, in how to deal with people appropriately and how to interact with people appropriately so that when they're, when they're faced with um, you know illness and are you know interacting with the healthcare system, there's just a, a, a better baseline, if you will, in how we in how patients are dealt with and how individuals and families are addressed, are treated, and we can start to head off some of what ends up being at times very harmful interactions um, with the healthcare system. And uh, lastly, here harness technology and build interventions that meet patients where they are. We have a tendency, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, to build technology that is that only we are a fan of in the healthcare system that serves, you know, um, that, that doesn't really meet the needs of, of the patients and or meet them where they are. And this, of course, became a, a big issue during, um, during uh, the, at the height of the COVID pandemic, uh, where we eventually relied, most of us, on technology to access healthcare and it was a lifesaver in many cases. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. A few, a few points, uh, a few issues, I think, to, 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 to tee up for this conversation. Um, as I mentioned, Bowen introduced the financing of Medicare, and we often, I think in a policy arena, many of our listeners today are probably from, from Capitol Hill, we don't talk enough about a huge and significant shift that has been happening in the Medicare program for the last 10 years, if not a little bit longer. So I thought it was important to set, to, to set this up as part of today's conversation. 26 million people 
enrolled in Medicare Advantage. Medicare Advantage is that Part C. So this is the private Medicare um, health plans. So if you choose, as you age, as you turn 65, you have two options. You can sign up for original Medicare, which is basically fee for service, or you can sign up for a Medicare Advantage plan. And there are many of them. So almost anywhere you live in this country, you have access to many. I think the average count is up to 36 different plans that you can sign up for. 42% of the Medicare population is in an MA plan. 60%, so of the folks who age into the program last year, 60% chose a Medicare Advantage plan over traditional Medicare. That's a very important signal, a significant signal as to the direction of the program. 32 million people, the department is expecting 32 million people to, to be an MA by 2023, which is next year. And that will be more than half of all Medicare beneficiaries. So this is a significant growth trend in the MA, private Medicare uh, program. It was not, a, I'm old enough to remember 10, 15 years ago where Medicare Advantage was discussed sparingly um, as part of the broader Medicare uh, policy discussion. And so as we're thinking about how we shore up Part A, this has to be a, a critical piece of the conversation because it is a different program uh, and, and is administered differently from uh, original Medicare. Next slide, please. So another uh, couple of points to, to raise as we think about broader trends and br current shifts in the ecosystem. Um, and there's been a major shift at, towards alternate sites of care uh, in recent years. I think in some ways escalated by the pandemic. So we see a lot of movement towards home, uh, you know, hospital at home, um, health at home, companies sort of, you know, sp sprouted um, uh, in the last few years, spurred and supported by investments in technology and digital health. And in that space, which is sort of its own ecosystem, you'll see, you know, remote monitoring, um, real world evidence, real world data, 24 hour data, uh, MSK or musculoskeletal uh, and you know even behavioral health uh, therapies all being galvanized by this investment in, in digital health and in moving health away from you know facilities or institutions or hospitals in this case. So that's an important trend I think we should bear in mind as we think about financing or how we change or, or refine the financing of Part A. Um, there's been a shift away from fee-for-service towards value-based care models, um, which basically is this notion of introducing risk into how you pay. So not just paying for every service, which is what fee-for-service is, but paying for um, services in sort of in, in either in capitated models or in bundled models and introducing this notion of outcomes. We want to pay for um, outcomes, pay for value, pay for, um, you know, experience, and that payment gets dialed up or down uh, based on a provider's performance. So that's this notion of risk. There's, because of that, an increased focus on social drivers of health and, you know, uh, appropriately, an increased focus in primary care Notionally, if you invest in primary care and individuals seek and use primary care, we can head off advanced illnesses, higher acuity um, illnesses in the future. And so if, you're, if your payments are at risk and you're, 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 you're judged as a provider on value, the healthier you can keep your population, the better off you will be and the better the, better the incentives are aligned, if you will, when it comes to payer and provider. The same thing with social drivers. If, as we know, 80% of variance in healthcare expenditures are explained by social factors, so things that don't necessarily occur within the healthcare system or within a hospital, and that's you know structural in nature, that's often a lot of discrimination, policy, you know, policies that sort of kept people uh, immobile or not well fed without good transportation. Um, poor housing, it's stunning how poor housing kind of infiltrates every aspect of one's life and leads to no good outcomes, poor education. 
if we have an increased focus on some of those drivers, some of which feel quite intractable uh, because they are systemic in nature, you can imagine how a focus on that to the extent that health systems can, can help improve outcomes of the patients that they treat. So that's why we see this increased focus on some of these social drivers, even though it's imperfect still, because again, they transcend the healthcare system. So there are reasons why I think there's been some stumbling in these initial years. Um, another important signal to, uh, to, to raise is the increased use of telehealth, which again, spiked during COVID, um, but we're starting to see that those rates are leveling off. Significant, there was a significant increase in 2020 and 2021 in the use of you know, audio or televisits so that people could continue to do, um, to, to meet with their healthcare providers while it was still very difficult or at least unsafe to meet in person, especially in clinical settings where presumably COVID rates and you know, the virus was basically much easier to spread. Um, you know, I think what, we, what we've seen so far in 2022, those rates leveled off. There's been some questions about ROI for some uh, institutions or companies that you know, poured in a bunch of money into the space in 2021. How sustainable were those increases? I think is a question, but it is a key part of how we deliver care right now, and it will continue to be. The question is, you know, what's the, what is the steady state, and and where where will we what what is no, what is normal, and where will that level off um, in the future? Um, and I think uh, it is absolutely imperative that I mention this. The health system writ large is experiencing significant pressures when it comes to staffing. We have a maldistribution of physicians already. We've known that for, for a couple of decades, several decades. We have a, sh a shortage of nurses uh, across health systems. We have a bunch of new companies um, often in, in pretty much every space you can imagine, uh, women's health, et cetera, all competing for the same pool of existing nurses um, so you have nurses currently working, have a, a much wider array of opportunities. I think COVID led to significant burnout. I mean, when we look at what uh, the feedback has been uh, from nurses, there's a reason why many have fled uh, hospital care. And I think there's, you know, what that has left health systems with is a significant 200, 300% increases in how much they spend on flex nursing, on uh, temporary staffing um, uh, options, and that is completely unsustainable. But you can imagine what impact that has across the system when you don't have enough people to staff um, a hospital bed or the impact it might have in the future if you don't have the right trained and the right supply of nurses to deliver care at home and in other alternate sites um, of care that we see growing in this, in this space. Uh, next slide, please. So all of those are not, what I think I've done is complicate the, 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 com the conversation by introducing a number of topics that we don't typically think about when we're talking about Medicare um, insolvency, but it does, it, 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 we have to contemplate and think about the current state and what the future, what it portends for what the future might look like. And I think that raises a couple of questions I thought I'd close with. Is our funding approach for Part A sustainable? Is our current funding approach for A, B, and D even the right framework right now? Um, is original Medicare, which is based on fee-for-service, and I think there's general consensus that fee-for-service is unsustainable and inefficient, is it the right model to drive health equity? When we think about health equity, you can provide incentives not just to Providers, you can provide incentives to, to plans. How much of a lever though do, is it, is original Medicare or traditional Medicare um, when this is one of the key questions for the health system moving forward? And which is related to the third question here, how best do we use the payment system, which is such a key lever, it doesn't solve everything, but it is a key lever um, to incentivize equity focused approach to healthcare. And what are the necessary inputs to address significant gaps in health and outcomes, which again, dis disproportionately affect 
racial and ethnic minorities. I would actually add women. I would add rural populations. We have a whole slew of categories for whom the health system doesn't quite meet their needs and expense, expenses as a, as a consequence are sort of are off um, relative to the benefits that they glean from, from interactions with the healthcare system. And we don't, you know, I think thinking about what we do as we refine or hopefully contemplate refining uh, part A to meet that the insolvency question is, is forcing us to, to address, um, hopefully will get us to something that looks more like a 21st century um, you know, payment system uh, overall. And I think that's my last slide. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Bill. Thank you, thank you, Adesi. I think you've raised some of the very basic questions that we have to address as we get into the reform area. So thank you again. We're gonna turn this now to Harriet uh, Kumasar. She's the, uh, again, the Senior Strategic Policy Advisor at AARP Public Policy Institute. So Harriet? Uh, it's up to you now. <laughs> thank you, Bill, and to everyone on the panel and the Alliance and the sponsors. Um, thank you, uh, everyone, for being here. Medicare is an enormously important part of our healthcare system. Currently, about 64 million Americans, nearly one-fifth of the population, have Medicare for their health insurance. Medicare provides both economic security and health care security by assuring beneficiaries that they'll be able to obtain medical care when they need it. Keeping Medicare financially strong is absolutely vital for people with Medicare and their families and for future generations. Next slide, please. Every year, the Medicare trustees provide an estimate of a financial outlook for the Part A trust fund, and in particular, the number of years until the trust fund becomes insolvent. As you can see here, throughout its history, the Part A trust fund has faced projections of insolvency. We've rarely, however, as Bill said in the introduction, that within four years of insolvency as we are right now. The last bar in this chart is based on the 2021 trustees report, which predicted insolvency in 2026, five years away when the report was issued and only four years away now. The last time we faced this short a time frame to act was more than 20 years ago in the late 1990s. And just as a reminder, if insolvency were ever to occur for the Part A trust fund, it would mean that Medicare cannot fully pay all of its bills for Part A services. Because revenue keeps flowing into the trust fund, Medicare would still have enough to pay for about 90, 91% of Part A bills. And another reminder is that insolvency is only concerned for Part A, which consists mainly of inpatient hospital services. The parts of Medicare that pay for doctor visits, other outpatient care, prescription drugs are not at risk of insolvency by design of the program and its financing. Thus, while it's absolutely essential to address Part A's financing challenge, the situation is not unique nor dire. That said, it's better to act soon and not wait until the last minute. By acting sooner to strengthen the trust fund, we can address the challenge by phasing and measured adjustments instead of needing a larger fix at the very last minute. Next slide, please. In thinking about options to strengthen Part A solvency, it's important to keep in mind the reasons why Medicare spending is growing. First, the Medicare population is getting larger. As the baby boomer generation ages, more and more people are reaching age 65 and joining Medicare. This enrollment growth accounts for about one third of the expected increase in Part A spending over the next five years. Therefore, in thinking about how to address solvency, it's important to recognize the program is covering more people and to think about how to spread these costs. While enrollment, growth, while enrollment growth is a major driver, the Medicare trustees also expect healthcare spending per person to grow. Growing healthcare costs is a challenge across the entire healthcare system or ecosystem, as Adazi was saying, and not just for Medicare. Therefore, it's important to address efficiency and value of healthcare broadly. That is to find ways to use our healthcare resources as effectively and fairly as possible. To improve efficiency, there's some potential opportunities here in telehealth, more home-based care, a lot of other areas. A key here, however, is that as we adopt new approaches to delivering care, we need to rigorously evaluate them to ensure that they're serving patients and families well, and indeed are improving value in healthcare. Next slide, please. In looking, uh, in looking at potential ways to strengthen solving, it's also really important to keep in mind that people with Medicare already face high out-of-pocket spending for healthcare and have limited financial resources. In a given year, half the people with Medicare already spend 16% or more of their income out of pocket on healthcare. And for people 
with Medicare and lower incomes, the share is even larger. Among people with income below 200% of the federal poverty level, and that's about one third of everyone covered by Medicare, they spend, half of them spend 25, 27% or more of their income on healthcare. That's more than one quarter of their income is going to healthcare. These out-of-pocket con costs consist of premiums for Medicare, which aren't trivial, premiums for supplemental insurance, such as Medigap, for people who have that, and cost sharing for Medicare covered services and medicines. They also include out-of-pocket costs for things that Medicare doesn't cover, such as most hearing and vision care, and most dental and long-term care. About, one, uh, about half of all people uh, in the Medicare population have income of less than $30,000 a year. Next slide, please. These high out-of-pocket costs have real consequences for, pe for people. In this analysis by one of my uh, AARP colleagues, 10% of people with Medicare report that they delay getting care that they delayed getting care during the past year because of cost. Among people with lower incomes, 18%, nearly one in five, reported that they delayed care because of cost. Next slide, please. Historically, Congress has typically strengthened the trust fund by adopting a package of fixes. Once again, a package of options could be applied, starting with approaches that increase efficiency and value of the program. In addition to the extremely important work on equity that Adazi has highlighted, um, one pl another place to start is by expanding successful innovative payment and delivery models. Several innovative models in traditional Medicare have shown success in controlling costs while maintaining, or better yet, improving quality. One example is accountable care organizations, which are being used in the private sector as well as by Medicare. Another example is Medicare's Independence at Home program. This program enables people with high needs to receive team-based primary care in their homes, leading to more person-centered care, the prevention of avoidable trips to the hospital, and high satisfaction among patients and their family caregivers. While the savings from innovative models like these have been relatively modest so far, these models need time to develop their full potential, and we should expand the successful ones. In addition, we should improve the balance between Medicare Advantage and traditional Medicare, the two tracks of the Medicare program. Research has shown that it currently costs Medicare more to cover people in Medicare Advantage plans than it would cost to cover the same people in traditional Medicare. At the same time, Medicare Advantage plans do offer some supplemental benefits that are not available in traditional Medicare. We should improve the balance between these two tracks in Medicare Let's make sure that we're using Medicare funds efficiently and in the best possible way for the Medicare population. Although the kinds of efficiency gains I've noted can help control spending, they're not likely to be enough to address both Medicare enrollment growth and the growth in healthcare spending per person. As the panel today is discussing, there are many other options to be considered. Next slide, please. So in considering various options, the key is to keep the focus on the people that Medicare serves. Looking at average effects or the impacts on a typical Medicare beneficiary is not sufficient. With any proposal, we must examine distributional effects and consider how people in different situations would be affected. For example, we need to consider how a potential policy would affect people with high medical needs as well as those with relatively less needs, people enrolled in private Medicare Advantage plans and people with traditional Medicare. Medicare beneficiaries under 65 with long-term disabilities as well as older Medicare beneficiaries. People with supplemental insurance, such as Medigap policies, people do not have supplemental insurance. And of course, people currently enrolled in the Medicare program as well as future generations. Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Medicare is a hugely popular program. People across generations recognize how vital the program is to both financial security and access to health care. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> the current Medicare population experiences this firsthand. Younger people see how the program serves their parents or grandparents, and they know it's important for their future selves. Keeping Medicare financially sound is, absolute, is in absolutely everyone's interest. My next slide just gives you a list of sources I used in case you want more details. And with that, I'll say thanks and turn it back to Bill. Thank you very much, Harriet. I, um, I just, uh, just want to note one small thing in terms of one of your charts that I love was an uh, early one, we need to act soon that in 1997, we were four years out from uh, the depletion of the trust fund. And then you'll see that we came back rather strong after that. Yeah. It, just so, it just so happens that 1997, having 
uh, staffing it at that time was the bipartisan balanced budget act that resulted. I would, um, you know, it's maybe too much to hope for, but I would hope that now we're down to about that same level that uh, some bipartisan approach to this might bring us back as it did back in 1997. Well, listen, the next uh, uh, speaker and expert here, Josh, is uh, really uh, going to lay out a number of options for us. So I'm going to turn it over to Josh and uh, it's up to you now to Give us the solutions, Josh. Uh, okay, I'll do my best and I'll try and point out some that I do think are bipartisan, uh, at least have had bipartisan support in the past. And uh, we'll go through a few kind of more specifically to get a sense for what um, Congress uh, and policymakers might be looking at um, if they seek to act sooner rather than later, which they should because that makes uh, solving things easier. Um, all right, uh, next slide. And you can skip that slide as well. Okay, so you've seen this a couple times, but um, it's a good starting point for figuring out um, what solutions we want to look at and, and kind of the relative effect of those solutions. So we have this gap uh, where benefits are higher than dedicated revenues. And the way to have solvency is to close that gap. And the way to have sustainable solvency is to make sure that once you close the gap, it stays closed uh, over the longer term. So when I go through these options, I'm really just gonna be talking about the 10-year solvency gap, which is about $350 billion. Um, but obviously the decisions you make to close that 10-year gap, some of them, could lead to insolvency immediately after those 10 years, and some of them might have more sustainable impacts. Uh, and I'll talk about uh, changes both on the benefit uh, and the revenue side. Next slide. Uh, so you've heard a lot about Medicare Advantage. Um, so here is just my uh, uh, Medicare Advantage section here. I mean, I, I think that the degree to which this is a um, dramatic change for Medicare, I think still is not appreciated. So at least if you take anything from uh, this talk today, you, you should realize that we now have basically two equal parts of Medicare. Uh, for the last 10 years, we've been focusing a lot on changing um, traditional fee-for-service Medicare into something that has more uh, value-based uh, care in it instead of volume-based care. Uh, but at the same time, we've been focusing on that for about a decade. Medicare Advantage has now grown uh, and will be over half of the entire uh, Medicare population uh, enrolled in the program um, starting next year and then really going forward on current trajectories. So uh, it's time to start thinking about how to save money in Medicare Advantage, um, just like we've spent some time uh, with CMMI and with other legislative changes on how to um, reduce costs in traditional Medicare. Next slide. So uh, when we think about Medicare Advantage, I think the, the main thing, and you, you just heard this, is to know that we are spending more uh, per beneficiary uh, in Medicare Advantage than if everyone would have just remained in fee-for-service. Uh, so uh, I think that is a problem that we need to solve. And it's kind of um, uh, like I'm optimistic about that problem in, in some ways because uh, this is not what I think we expected. We expected if you had private plans covering individuals in Medicare Advantage, those plans would be able to control costs better than the unrestrained fee-for-service uh, part of Medicare. And actually, we think they have been able to control costs relative to fee-for-service Medicare. It's just that we're paying those plans a lot more uh, than we uh, need to be paying them because they are saving money. But the government is not actually seeing those savings. So when we think about how to fix the trust fund issue, I think it's time to have Medicare Advantage plans start sharing uh, those savings and the ways that they control costs uh, with the government to help improve overall healthcare spending and also uh, the trust fund. Uh, so um, I, I think there are a bunch of design issues that we can attack. Some of those uh, attacks would be more comprehensive in nature and some would be more specific in nature. 
Um, so some of the comprehensive changes, uh, we uh, could turn uh, the way Medicare Advantage payments are uh, created now into a competitive bidding situation. Uh, right now, Medicare Advantage uh, plans are paid based on benchmarks that are built on top of the fee-for-service Medicare system, uh, and we could have more competition in Medicare Advantage uh, through competitive bidding that would uh, get us some savings over 10 years and then uh, over the longer term. Uh, MedPAC has looked at another sort of comprehensive way uh, to fix the problem through uh, a, a reform of the benchmark system. Um, they don't exactly score uh, their reform proposals, uh, but I think we would expect that uh, if uh, we changed the benchmark system, we would get something similar to what uh, the competitive bidding um, proposal that is most notably uh, put forth by Brookings um, going forward. Uh, and then this uh, has been actually uh, suggested by uh, presidential budgets in the past. The Obama budget uh, did have some form of payment reform with competitive bidding, uh, not as comprehensive as the Brookings model, uh, but did save money um, over the 10 years. Uh, next slide. Uh, and then there are some more kind of targeted reforms that would at least get some savings from the overpayments we know that are going to Medicare Advantage. Uh, one of the things I work on um, in the Health Savers Initiative uh, was an options brief to figure out um, how much more we're spending on Medicare Advantage because of what we call coding intensity. Uh, basically, the way insurance plans are paid uh, in Medicare Advantage, uh, there's an incentive for them to report more diagnoses per beneficiary than is in traditional fee-for-service. So it makes their enrollees look sicker on paper uh, than they are in actuality when you compare similarly situated individuals uh, in fee-for-service. So we estimate that this coding intensity and this behavior by private insurance plans is a really large problem. Our estimate was that nearly 20% uh, of payments uh, in MA can be explained by this coding intensity. Uh, MedPAC has a smaller estimate of about 9%. <clears throat> right now, CMS knows that this is a problem uh, and statutorily they're required to adjust uh, for this coding intensity uh, a minimum of 5.9% uh, and they have never exceeded that minimum adjustment. Uh, and I think, uh, so we can look at either congressional action here or CMS action to uh, more uh, properly address this coding intensity. And you can see that you can get a range of savings from doing this. Uh, the Health Savers Initiative estimate was about 185 billion uh, in Part A. Uh, MedPAX gets you less than that. We also give bonuses to um, Medicare Advantage plans um, in order to maintain quality uh, plan offerings for beneficiaries. Uh, but right now, about 90% of all plans get these quality bonuses. Uh, and uh, obviously, if everyone is excellent, we're not really measuring um, quality in, in any real sense. And yet, it's costing a lot of money to give these bonuses. And those bonuses also exacerbate racial inequality uh, and um, geographic uh, inequality of payment. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> Uh, so you heard a little bit about this, the, and I know there are some questions about this. Why do we have all these parts of Medicare? Uh, why do we have different financing mechanisms for these different parts? Well, it's also confusing for beneficiaries with these different parts because the different parts have different deductibles. Uh, there's a hodgepodge of cost sharing rules. And importantly, there's no catastrophic cap, uh, capping benefits in, in Medicare. So uh, the very sick Medicare beneficiaries, especially ones that haven't purchased supplemental um, Medigap coverage wind up spending a lot of money out of pocket. And that really makes no sense for, a, um, for an insurance design. You, you wouldn't want to design an insurance system that has no cap on um, uh, for catastrophic expenses. Uh, so one way to get at this would be to modernize the Medicare benefit design to create a single combined deductible that has uniform uh, cost sharing uh, and an out-of-pocket cap. This is something that's been uh, proposed by uh, Republicans and Democrats. Uh, and when you do this, 
you sort of make there no reason to buy supplemental Medigap coverage, which actually helps us save some money because Medigap coverage uh, has misaligned incentives uh, for utilization. Uh, and also modernizing the benefit design might allow fee-for-service Medicare uh, to become more attractive than it is now relative to Medicare Advantage because of having a more simplified plan design. Uh, the CBO has looked at uh, a 10-year savings for this, and uh, that would close about 30% of the solvency gap. Uh, CRFB has estimated kind of a more rapid uh, change to this modernized Medicare design that could close about 50% of the solvency gap. Next slide. Uh, you heard a little bit about this. I, I think when you look at Medicare, one of the main um, areas uh, for excessive profits by providers where, where revenue uh, vastly exceeds costs and where a lot of our geographic variation in terms of high cost and low cost Medicare areas around the country uh, can really be traced back to different uses of post-acute care, uh, which is just the care that happens after a recovery from an injury or illness uh, when you've been hospitalized. There are four different main sites of this post-acute care. There are four different payment models for those four sites, and that leads to a lot of inefficiency where you're uh, paying more for some patients, less for other patients, uh, and a misaligned um, care experience as well uh, for patients when they leave the hospital. Uh, so this is another area where there have been calls for bipartisan reform. Uh, MedPAC has looked into this a lot. And in really here, you can kind of in emergency to extend solvency, reduce payments across the board, uh, or you can make more fundamental changes to the design of post-acute care and how we pay for it. Uh, so the Trump administration had a proposal to reduce and unify uh, PAC payments. Uh, the Obama administration had a proposal to just cut payments across the board. Uh, there are bundling plans where you can kind of change the uh, incentives and how we use post-acute care. Uh, and then you can kind of do a complete comprehensive reform uh, that uh, CRFB is estimated to save about $150 billion over 10 years and close about 45% of the solvency gap. Next slide. Uh, one of the other things that I, I'm not sure how many of you know this, but we pay for our uh, medical education through Medicare Part A, uh, which is in some ways kind of a happenstance and, and, and sort of an outdated notion of how we should pay for uh, medical education. I think there's a debate about how much the government should be doing this versus the private sector. There's a debate about whether this should really be located in Medicare Part A versus uh, general Medicare spending, uh, because doing it through Part A uh, leads to a kind of over-focus on inpatient settings uh, and uh, creates a geographic imbalance. Uh, and also, uh, private health insurers don't really uh, spend very much to uh, prod uh, Medicare uh, education. We also have this GME system that uh, has put an artificial cap on the number of doctors and um, you heard a little bit about the staffing shortages uh, and uh, one of the key pieces going forward is that um, we really should increase the supply of providers and that would also help lower costs uh, to some degree. So reforms could focus just on moving it out of part A, it could focus on addressing the workforce issues uh, and it could focus on some savings. Uh, and uh, the, the Trump administration had a, a really dramatic proposal that moved um, GME out of Medicare Part A and had a, a fair amount of cost uh, cutting. Uh, and then you have some other options that the Obama administration proposed and that CBO has looked at. Next slide. Uh, and then we get to new revenue. And uh, I leave new revenue for last uh, only because when you talk about sustainable solvency, uh, we have two problems contributing to solvency. We have a revenue problem and a spending problem. The spending problem is driven by the increase in retirees uh, uh, and because of the growth of healthcare costs. Uh, and I think any sustainable solution for Medicare needs to focus on bringing healthcare costs down. Uh, this would help in Medicare, this could help in the commercial sector, uh, so it really has a 
kind of broader appeal than just solvency. Uh, but after we do that, we might still need new revenue. And uh, there clearly are some uh, solutions that we can have to have that gap closed, both from the top of spending and uh, bringing the bottom of revenue up. Uh, so interestingly, this is kind of a, a debate right now in, in Washington. The Biden administration in last year's budget um, closed some loopholes through the net investment income tax, uh, and uh, they dedicated some of that revenue uh, to the HI trust fund, and they offered to move uh, the current net revenue um, uh, to dedicate that to the trust fund. And that has a pretty uh, dramatic effect. You can see the second line, we almost double the closing of the solvency gap, both by getting that new revenue and by moving revenue that right now is not dedicated to the trust fund, but could be dedicated to the trust fund. Now, uh, I just want to caution that uh, just moving revenue uh, and dedicating it to the trust fund, uh, but not getting new revenue into the federal budget doesn't really uh, give us new resources to address our healthcare costs. So uh, we don't think that this solvency gap should be closed just by transferring existing government revenue into the trust fund. Uh, we think there is plenty of room to raise taxes, both to solve the overall budget problem, but also uh, to fix some of this uh, trust fund solvency issue. Uh, so uh, we think that closing loopholes in the NIT uh, and taking that revenue and dedicating it to the trust fund uh, does make a lot of sense. Uh, the House passed Build Back Better Act actually does close those NIT loopholes, uh, but they do not dedicate the revenue to the trust fund. Uh, we would think that um, at some point, uh, someone should talk about doing that because uh, that would kind of kill two birds with one stone by bringing new revenue in uh, and also at the time dedicating it to the trust fund. And then you can see we have a couple other options for revenue. You could always just increase the payroll tax to bring new revenue in. Uh, and then there's a, uh, you could put a tax on sugar sweetened beverages, which have downstream health effects uh, that would also uh, contribute to the trust fund uh, issue. Uh, and with that, uh, I am done and look forward to hearing everyone's questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Josh. Uh, if the uh, panelists would come back on uh, on screen so uh, we can have a discussion here and uh, maybe we should take down uh, the uh, slide. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, great uh, presentation to all. Um, I'm taking. I'm. I'm going to try to play the old budget uh, staff director's role of seeing if they would have any any uh, solutions here. And I guess I'm hearing here at the end uh, on a couple of things, uh, particularly as it relates to net tax. But uh, let's go to something that, and then we'll get. There's questions, and again, please send in your questions. Let Let's clarify something here real quickly. One of the one of the questions that did come in was. Uh, uh, does the comparison between uh, Medicare Advantage and fee-for-service recognize the extra benefits that the MA plans provide? Somebody want to answer that question for the, uh, the questioner out there? I think it does. I don't think there's any. It, that does make a difference. Josh? Or? Yeah, I, I mean, I could just say that the um, we are spending more on Medicare Advantage, and it is true that some of that extra money is flowing to new benefits or uh, for beneficiaries that aren't available in fee-for-service, like hearing um, vision benefits uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, it does not account for the entire overpayment for those benefits. Those benefits make up, uh, I think, a small amount uh, of where that overpayment uh, is being put toward. Good. Uh, I, I want to try, there's a big theme here that I'm picking up, which I like, and that is, and let's go back to it, when a, a Daisy started this discussion, and I think uh, Bowen and Harriet, you can fill in, this is much different program, uh, the, let me rephrase that, health insurance being delivered today is much different than it was at the time that the Medicare program was established back in 1965 under a kind of a Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, model. Uh, I am struck by Daisy's figures, and Josh, one of your figures says 50% are in, will be in uh, Medicare Advantage, 50% uh, of the Medicare beneficiaries. Uh, but I also would note that um, the accountable care organization type uh, experiments are also, if I understand that, it's about 23. So 
by next year, maybe a close to 75% of Medicare recipients will not be uh, in the old fee for service uh, mechanism and the accounting or the financing mechanism was set up as it relates to that type of an uh, arrangement. So I think it's absolute, uh, one theme I'm taking away from this is that uh, we should uh, definitely be looking at the uh, delivery system and focusing on Medicare Advantage uh, as an example. Um, now, having said that, um, when you have 50% or so of the population on that program, and a lot of the proposals that uh, Josh had put out here somehow maybe reduce or the benefits becomes a little bit more political. Tell me about the politics of uh, uh, reducing Medicare Advantage, uh, which I seem to recall might have been a more of a Republican proposal at the time that it was put together uh, many years ago. Uh, thoughts on that? And then I'll come back to some of the su submitted questions. I, I can start since I, I, I teed up the Medicare Advantage um, dynamic. And Bill, I think it's because in the policy space, it feels like we're having a conversation that is 20 years out of date. And then because I'm in the private sector and I think about as part of my work, I think about the payment policy in general, not just Medicare, but commercial, but with within Medicare, MA has an outsized plays an outsized role in what is happening in the broader ecosystem. It just feels like we're having two very different conversations. So for, as far as I was concerned, to think about any policy refinements, I call it refinements because that is a political, politically palatable term than complete overhaul, but any policy or payment refinements on the Part A, on the, on the Part A side that does not take into account what these new trends signal when it comes to enrollment into Medicare Advantage just misses the mark. I feel like it's a it's a it's an out of date conversation. Now, why is why is it difficult to contemplate changes to Medicare? It's because by necessity, it doesn't take a, a a Medicare expert or someone with a PhD in economics to figure out that you're probably talking about winners and losers. Somebody will win and somebody will, will lose. Um, on the MA side, and I don't wanna have this conversation devolve into payment, payment reforms for, for Medicare Advantage, because I think that's a different conversation, but a necessary one. As a policy person, we just have to have it. Um, but if you're talking about any benefit design, we're talking about scaling something back, because I think we've, come, we've recognized that we can't pay for everything. That might have been the conversation in 1965, but the baby boom generation had not started to retire, nor do we have this other compression effect in terms of how many people are paying into the program right now that threatens receipts, right? And that's why we have an insolvent uh, trust fund looming. Um, if we're talking about uh, payment reform or payment rates, that means that some providers are going to get a little bit less than perhaps what they would like, perhaps what they think delivery of services would cost. If we're talking about payment rates um, or you know, changing benchmarks in MA, that again implicates somebody getting less than what they would like. And I think that's why this is a politically difficult, that's one of the reasons. The other reason of course, is that we're talking about the Medicare population. We said 62 million, that's a huge voting block and they, they, they vote. And so, you know, whenever you're talking about a population or program that affects a population that is that big, that represents that much of a share of the American population and they vote, that just introduces difficult dynamics on both sides of the aisle. Yeah, and I think that's a segue. Bowen, you wanna respond? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, on the Medicare Advantage question, um, you know, um, traditional Medicare has a very, very low administrative cost. And so for MA plans, they do some fine things, um, you know, but they come with an additional level of administrative cost uh, and profits. Uh, some of the fine things they do are they provide, they provide a lot of extra benefits to beneficiaries. Beneficiaries like it. So beneficiaries like MA, a lot of them increasingly, plans like MA, they can be very profitable. It was set up to put private for sector forces into motion to save Medicare money. It has never saved 
Medicare money. And so, you know, the payment reforms on the table for Medicare Advantage have to have a serious look and they start at every point of it. And they are related to the migration from traditional Medicare to MA, right? There's the benchmarking system that has to have a traditional to, to as its basis. There's the, the, the bonus system where everyone's very well above average and gets bonuses. You know, and then there's the upcoding uh, situation that uh, that Josh mentioned. All of these need to be addressed on MI, on the MI side. Thank you, thank you. Um, and, and and there's a, n quite a few questions have come in. Uh, fundamental question, one that I always have too, is just why do we have these different uh, uh, part A, part B uh, uh, uh financing mechanisms. We can come back to that, but I really want to, Harriet, to you to respond to uh, a question that was specific to you. You said there is needs to balance traditional Medicare and Medicare Advantage enrollment. What did you mean by that? Do you think Medicare Advantage enrollment should increase as it has doing or decrease? And what is good balance between the two? Uh, yeah, sorry, I might have misspoken. I didn't mean enrollment. I meant the programs, and it's the issues that we've been talking about here. You know, how should we be spending our money efficiently in both parts of this, you know, both tracks of Medicare? And so, um, and as the, the larger Medicare Advantage becomes as part of the program, the more imperative it is to look at how these are balanced and that we're using our money well in both sectors. Got it. Uh, and Josh, the other clarifying question is to you, can you explain the solvency gap closed metric, I think? I want to make sure I understand it correctly. Uh, it, that's just what, what it would take to extend solvency from 2026 to the end of the budget window 2031. It would take about $350 billion in either lower spending or increased revenue. Um, there's a there's an interesting question here, and I, some uh, I was around. Maybe some of you I may have been around at the time. There was an interesting question here from one of the uh, uh, from the audience about uh, catas the catastrophic uh, uh, Rostenkowski, as I seem to recall, uh, proposal that caused him some real problems. Uh, and what happened? What happened to the catastrophic? And are there lessons to be learned when we start making changes? particularly in uh, Medicare from the catastrophic uh, debacle of many years ago. Does anybody recall all the, what went on there? Maybe Harriet, I hate to put you on the spot, but I imagine AARP was involved a little bit in that. It's kind of, kind of before my time, <laughs> but, right. but, but I, I, I would say that um, I, I do think that it's really important to like in any major, uh, consideration of any major reform to look, it has to be done in the context of improving the situation for Medicare beneficiaries, which includes um, yeah, making the program simpler and easier to navigate, um, protecting them from high out-of-pocket costs. So I think as I'm recalling, I, I just don't know whether numbers measured up with the sentiment, but people were very concerned that it was gonna raise their costs. And perhaps they saw that part clearly and didn't clearly understand the benefits. And risk protection is a hard thing to get your head around and to, to value, actually. So I, I think, yeah, yeah, that's think, my recollection. Yeah. I think it, 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 it caused some real discontent, yeah. discontent out there amongst those particular people who would be affected by it as usual. And they, and they were very vocal. Um, unless anybody have any other comments there, I want to, go to uh, this very, maybe very overly simplistic question. Why can't we just collapse A and B? Uh, we are moving away from hospital. We are trying to move more toward uh, home-based care, out of the hospital care. What's wrong with just taking A and B and collapsing it all and getting rid of this, this uh, the differences between the two financing mechanisms? We, uh, Go ahead, Bowen. Well, I mean, it, it, it could be part of a very um, ra rational policy. You could rationalize the cost sharing differences um, that, that uh, beneficiaries face between A and B. 
you can um, impose more budget discipline on on the B side if you if you did that and you don't have to keep the trust fund structure but you could um, and you could be giving the catastrophic uh, cap um, across both parts and throw D in and as well if you like um, you know to protect beneficiaries as as Josh was saying um, and and you can do that in a way that's budget neutral like you can you can when you unify the cost sharing, you can do it in such a way that can um, that can make you know it will shift some things around. But you can you can do it in such a way that you can provide some more benefits and raise potentially raise the cost sharing while or or just have some extra revenues to make it um, budget neutral, but provide the additional protection for beneficiaries when you do it. Anybody? I would I would I would add that um, I'm just reiterating some of my previous thoughts that. Uh, you have to transitions can be tough so you have to do them really thoughtfully and carefully and consider how people in different situations are affected so even if on the whole it's quite budget neutral you know we, we want it to work well for the medicare population so they have to be clear gains in terms of easier to navigate and then take serious consideration of how people in different situations people with high health hospital costs people with low hospital costs people with chronic conditions people with low use of services the people in different geographic areas people in traditional Medicare and, and Medicare Advantage are affected because those those details matter a lot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just another thought, Bill. I mean, if, if we're thinking about the ideal, then why not collapse A, B, and D, right? Mm -hmm. There is no world where we, we conceive of health services use among seniors that doesn't include pharmaceutical so if we're really thinking, if we're gonna go through the, because it's gonna be, it's hard to do minor policy in healthcare, let alone big, you know, co complete overhaul. If we're gonna contemplate an overhaul, then let's think about what right now fee for service or original Medicare is compared against. It's compared against something that's much simpler, much easier to wrap your head around because MA mimics our options when we are employed, right? Employer-sponsored insurance. So it's something that's much more familiar for the average person who has had health insurance during their working years. And so if we're gonna contemplate the, the original Medicare, the traditional Medicare program, then yes, I think A, B, and D, pharmaceutical services should be part of that conversation. But I, I take Harriet's points very well. We ha it's not just about budget neutrality. How does this benefit the beneficiary so that we don't have huge consequences that just make it unpalatable when you age into the program? Um, thank you. Uh, General, uh, kind of a more, uh, there's a question here as to the qual uh, a, a question on quali quality delivery system reforms, trying to consolidate here. Can panelists comment on effectiveness of hospital-focused quality delivery reforms in addressing the solvency gap? Audience notes it's a very important, or the uh, the audience important health equity issue too. Uh, I'm not sure I fully understand. Can panelists comment on effectiveness of hospital-focused quality delivery reforms in addressing the solvency gap. I guess how do, I guess the question is generally how do you close this gap while maintaining quality? Yeah, I, I, that, that's that's a helpful reframing. I, cause I I'm not perhaps the panelist is asking about whether quality quality programs work and do they have an effect on health equity? And if if I were if that construction is accurate, let me answer that question just because it's helpful <laughs> for me. Um, I think it's you know part of the part of one of our mistakes in healthcare policy in 2002 2003 after the IOM reports came out around crossing the quality chasm and um, to air is human and um, um, why am I blanking on the report that focused on health equity and healthcare disparities. But when those three reports came out generally around the same time, we bifurcated artificially our focus on quality from our focus on health equity. But the two were always meant to go together because 
researchers who've been in this space for 30 years knew that if you focus on subpopulation, which after a while, they're not so small, right? They're, they tend to be big numbers. You actually improve quality overall. So the focus on quality has not been bad for healthcare. We haven't done it perfectly. We've leaned too heavily on reporting. We are very good at coming up with quality measures that measure nothing. We're very good at teaching to the test. We're very good at you know, doing well on the things that are reported so, because there's a reporting bias, which we know basically in health services is natural. What we haven't done as well are some of those harder sociological things around subpopulations, populations that are hard to reach, hard to engage, certainly bias training I mentioned, how you even interact with people from different cultures to, to, and to try to meet some of those needs. And so quality for those people, while we've seen some improvements, the rising tide has not floated all boats. And I think there was a new paper yesterday, a couple of days ago that came out um, in, in JAMA. Somebody will correct me, I'm sure, momentarily. But a new paper just came out basically showing us that, yes, while we've seen some improvements in some of these outcome measures, minority populations have not done as well. And in fact, mortality rates have stagnated, if not gone up. So a lot of room for improvement there. I would not fault the health system for doing as much as we can on, on quality measurement. It was necessary back in 2000. Thank you. I'm going to, uh, very helpful, uh, uh, Josh, I'm going to uh, put this question to you and then I'd like all of you to respond. This was a, a discussion about the HI Trust Fund. And as we said, as you've all uh, uh, put forth, uh, the last year's 21 uh, trustees report said that the, uh, the fund would be depleted by 20. 26. Uh, that was produced at a time right in the middle of uh, COVID. Uh, but at the same time, we've had uh, uh, increasing inflation, dramatic inflation. That works in some ways. Wages are up uh, for providing additional resources from the payroll tax. On the other hand, uh, maybe increasing uh, hospitalizations has work on the negative side of uh, increasing expenditures. Uh, kind of put you guys on the line here. Um, as I said at my opening comments, the Congressional Budget Office, my, I'm an alumni of that organization, so I'm biased, uh, we'll, we'll put out their estimates next uh, Wednesday. And uh, rumor has it that the trust fund, uh, the Social Security and Medicare trust fund reports should be coming out soon. Last year they came out end of August, who knows exactly. But if you were to uh, take the economy, the changes in the economy, along with COVID, increasing inflation in the account, how is that going to affect the, uh, that date of 2026? Josh, uh, can you uh, put your economist hat on and tell me what we should expect, anticipate? And then I'd like to hear everybody else's guesstimate, if nothing else. Yeah, I mean, as long as this isn't one of those things where uh, a week uh, from now, someone's going to say this pundit said X, and he, you know, it was wrong. It was just a hot take. Uh, but uh, I, I mean, my if I had to guess, I would guess that it is more likely than not that CBO might extend the solvency date by a year or so, um, and that's because uh, I think revenues are coming in a lot stronger than um, maybe would have been projected uh, because. Um, as you mentioned, inflation is leading to higher wages and that will come into the trust fund. And I think the kind of increase in costs uh, because of COVID, I'm not sure that we've seen that to the same degree. And maybe you would even have slightly uh, lower costs uh, over the short term. So uh, I, I think maybe it would be extended by maybe a year or so, but uh, nothing too dramatic. I think one of the interesting things about HI balance is that over the like the time period from when it is solvent to insolvent, you're talking about changes of just a few billion dollars pushes something into the next year. Um, over the five-year time period, there is no doubt we are going to have a large gap there and there will be uh, insolvency like beyond 2026. So um, whether it's one year or two years different, it still doesn't uh, really matter for the big debate here. Still have a problem, and, and yep. yes, we still have a problem regardless. 
Um, we are running out of time here, unfortunately, uh, but uh, maybe uh, we could use this as a wrap up here uh, and you could uh, comment on your estimate of when the trust fund will uh, exhaust uh, uh, Bowen and Daisy and Harriet and use that as a, and any other comments you want to make as we close out here uh, uh, this uh, great discussion. Uh, so, Bowen? Yeah, so I was, I was um, kind of uh, impressed that um, the trustees pre-COVID estimate and their post-COVID estimate were so similar despite all that happened um, right. in, in between. And I agree that the exact timing isn't as important as it's, you know, it's on track to happen and um, and it's going to be soon. It's, it's soon enough to just call it really, really soon. <laughs> and it's important <laughs> enough just to call it really, really soon. Yeah. Um, and we have, um, you know, I guess it's going to somewhat depend on what also happened. There's wage inflation, but what's happening to healthcare price inflation? Uh, in the meantime, right now, are we going to have a recession um, anytime soon? Um, that could, that could have implications. And so, um, you know, the the there's you know there's a large menu of things that have been proposed. Um, you know, you can you can do things that offer um, some some benefits while also um, getting more rigorous on the financing. And there's such a such a good menu of things to choose from. Um, you know, some of them are really harder than others. I think the easy ones are ones where you think there's very good evidence base that there's overpayment going on or that there's just something that's just not really right in the tax code that can be corrected. I'll yeah. stop there. Thank you. Harriet, and then okay. you you'll yeah. have the last one. I will. Um, I don't know how the, the, the balances of, you know, more revenue coming in, as Josh said, versus um, uh, more spending is going to balance out, but I'll just add inflation to, you know, say it just right out loud, you know, the hospital, so part A is very much about what hospital payment rates are and how much hospitals get paid. And there is a market basket index that determines increases in their payment rates. And in components of that are based on uh, reflect price increases in their input costs, which is wages and energy costs and other things. So I think, you know, there's also going to be a push, uh, you know, to shorten time to insolvency because of those rises. I don't know how it all balances out. And, <laughs> and when you don't know and you have to guess, I like your approach, Bill, just <laughs> stay the course. <laughs> as long as we're not held, as long as we're not held to our, our guesses, I, I, I agree with all the points made. I, I just, you know, just one point to remember, uh, the, cause the price index in the, in it for health or medical is higher than you know, the general price index. So Bill, I'm a, an alumni of Congressional Budget Office. CPI U is different from CPI Medical. And so when I think about um, what it, you know, sort of the pressure is on the healthcare system, I feel like we're not measuring it or talking about it right now, but it's probably a little bit higher um, in, in, that, in that department. I will say that um, I agree with Bowen, you know, when the trustees report came out late last year, I was quite surprised at how non-different it was. But one thing that was notable last year was that they baked in the increased death rates of Medicare beneficiaries or seniors. And it had essentially, you know, in some way a morbid conversation, it, it reduced the impact, if you will, in terms of expenditures on the program. So that has been accounted for. What we now have is this inflationary factor um, and just an economic picture that I think will probably lead to maybe a, a year earlier uh, insolvency. But again, 26 is like tomorrow in, in this in this world. Uh, and without major policy considerations or a debate going on, if it doesn't feel too far off that we might actually hit it. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Harriet, Daisy, Bowen, and Josh. Uh, I had a, I apologize to the audience that weren't able to get to all of your questions. I had a bunch more questions to ask too. I wanted to get into the age question of Daisy and I've had some discussions about that. Uh, uh, but uh, there are so many options, so many, Josh has laid them out. No surprise, uh, I'll get my uh, shot in here from the Bipartisan Policy Center. I think it has, I think any solutions have to include both a combination of revenues and benefits if we are to be serious about uh, achieving any kind of a sustainable 
recovery in this fund. But I also do think that fundamental reform, not tinkering around Part A, Part B, Part D, I think the Medicare program is due for a fundamental look at its overall financing mechanisms. And I'm not sure that the HI Trust Fund is, is only the only issue that we should be looking at today. Thank you again, and I appreciate the audience's uh, participation today. And with that, I will uh, have to say uh, goodbye to everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. Bye. Yeah.